Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, one of the big questions that I've been asking now for much of the month of October is when is this pattern going to break down? Um, I had at the end of September, beginning of October, thought we would already be in our pattern change, but persistence has really kind of won this game, and this has been a difficult one to break down. And what, am, what are we trying to break down is this, this wave train. There's a ridge here. There's a trough in the Gulf of Alaska, a massive, nearly immovable ridge that's between Greenland and the Hudson Bay, uh, right in through here, and then this other trough. So the flow is coming through something like this. And it's just, we just haven't been able to shake it. It's been around, it's been very, very persistent. I wanna talk about that, because that's gonna influence our long range forecast, which is what we're gonna be talking about here first today. So this is what we're gonna break away from if we're gonna break away from something. And what it's led to is a temperature pattern that's looks something like this. We've been much colder, you know, on that side of the continental divide. Okay, that's where we've had the deeper troughs in the Gulf of Alaska. And the ridging here has kept temperatures in some places up to about 15 degrees warmer than normal over the last 15 days or so in this area. Now, thinking about that, I want to specifically hone in right here in the Great Lakes states, the upper Midwest. I'm just going to pick that area because if we're going to see a pattern shift, it will ultimately be affecting this area. So I went out and I just reconstructed using a great tool here. It's called Climate at a Glance. I looked at the average temperature for November from 1970 to present. And I'm, again, I'm looking at that upper Midwest climate zone. So this is the data. And what I did was I ranked it, <clears throat> excuse me, according to coldest uh, to warmest. And I plucked off these Novembers. Now, what I was curious about was, were there any clues in October that we could then use to get into November and forecast it? Now, normally month to month correlations are low, but sometimes a month will set up the next month on what it's going to be seeing. And so this is what, what I learned. Those Octobers that we had before the really cold Novembers here did not have big ridges in place there. The ridges were here. The ridge was off the East Coast. And what ended up happening is we were able to take this pattern and build up a very large, I call it a storehouse, but a storehouse here of colder air here and also very cold air in place here. Now we have not seen this at all this year. So what happens is, is that then when November comes along, because remember, this is what happened in October, that cold air is in place that can be kind of let out across the upper Midwest, across the plains into the Northeast, while the West typically stays quite warm. So this would be what it would take in order to get to get to a cold November. We'd have to have some help from the end of October. That's one way, at least. There's another thing. We always look at the tropics, the, the energy transition or the energy um you know, translation, the movement of it out of the tropics is important. The Octobers of those really cold Novembers tended to keep the MJO over here, over Africa. This is phase one and two and three. A lot of subsidence over the Pacific. And then you have almost like a reflection of that right over here, over South America. And again, here's the years what we're looking at. And then as you get into November, we tend to continue that. A lot of rising motion in this area, but some of it getting over here just north of, of, um, of Australia. But a lot of subsidence there. Now, I'm thinking about that because remember, one of my big failure points back at the end of September, beginning of October was I had bought into the models forecasting a pass of six into seven meaning that we were going to take the MJO right across the Western Pacific, break the whole pattern down, and it didn't do that. It shifted right here. So what ended up happening is, being in phase five and six, there's about a 14, 15 day lag on this. What we ended up getting was the, the persistence of, of the warmth, and it reinforced that ridge that was between uh, you know, um, the Hudson Bay and, and, and Greenland. Now, the MJO has now come over to the other side. And you can almost think of them being opposite. So one and two are opposite of six and five. And that's great. It's low amplitude. But just remember, the teleconnection isn't instantaneous. It takes time to, translate, to, to, to translate, to move that, that energy, that momentum out of the tropics. So what are we looking at? I don't know, 10 to 15 days before the effect of this is felt across North America. And I'm going to get to that in just a second here. There's another part of this as well, um, and let's just go look at it here. We don't see the MGO moving much. It's going to stay right here in phase one, two, kind of in three. And therefore, this is going to also sit over the top of South America. And in my South America video, you'll see what that's doing to precipitation there. 
But this La Nina is fine. It's it's still, look, we got some strong trade wins over the next 15 days. They were right here. This La Nina is just fine. And you want to know what's interesting? A really cold November for the upper Midwest doesn't really have a strong ENSO signal. In fact, it's probably warm here. We don't have that. And it's very warm there. And we most certainly do not have that. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that if there's going to be a pattern change, we might not see it for another. I mean, I'm talking about where we can actually get some cold air in place across the northern plains, the Great Lakes into the northeast, some actual cold air. Well, this plus what's currently going on at the MJO, that's going to give us a delay. Plus the fact that October didn't set us up by not building up, go look at it again, not building up cold air on this side of the Rockies means we still have some delay in when this is going to get here. And just a reminder, keeping cold air, water here, here, and here, it, these are not strong signals for a brutally cold November. There will be a change, a shift in the pattern. It will break down. But the point to say here is that the longer range models aren't going to see it right away. And this is the November forecast from the ECMWF Weekly. So I usually wait in the afternoon to get these done or to get this out to you. Uh, today when I did it, though, I'm sorry, this is a little bit later than normal. I had a parent-teacher conference, just the normal one here. My kids are fine. Uh, and then also uh, my son has a soccer game. So we're recording a little later, but I always wait on this. And that um, forecast for November carries the warmth here. And to be honest, it even gives us a, a kind of a La Nina look at precipitation where we're going to stay wetter along the West Coast, uh, better chances of seeing near normal precipitation in the plains, upper northern plains, excuse me, over to the Ohio River Valley or drier south. That's a very typical pattern for uh, November when, when, when we've got a La Nina that's brewing. Now, what's really interesting about this is let's go back to that temperature pattern because remember, I'm trying to forecast when that's going to break down. Uh, and if we look at it again, we're going to favor more warm days than, than cool and, you know, in this whole side of North America. Uh, this is the, 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 the uh, ECMWF. This is what the uh, CFSV2 is saying. It doesn't want to let this pattern go uh, at all. Uh, three degrees Celsius, um, three and a half degrees Celsius warm bias here. Uh, warm anomaly, same thing here. This goes all the way to the 17th. So um, when cooler air comes through in the next 15 days or so, it's a shot. It's coming through and it'll retreat. It's not going to be that sustained brutal cold if you're east of the Rocky Mountains. West of the Rocky Mountains, we've got a whole different pattern going on there. So that's it. That That's my long range right out of the way right here at the beginning. Now, what are we dealing with in the near term? Well, we do have some cold air, but this is normal. I mean, we're past the average first frost date by a long shot here in this section of the country. We got, we were in the 20s even this morning on Thursday in Nebraska. So there's frost advisories and, and a freeze warning here, but all the action is going to come into the west here. And I want to talk about where this pattern is going in the near term. So we got the long term out of the, out of the way in the beginning. Now, take a look. Let this reset here. There we go. What you've got loaded up in the Gulf of Alaska right here and then behind it, two deep cyclones, deep low pressure systems. And they're going to come on shore. They're going to produce very strong winds and a lot of snow, and they are loaded with moisture. we got the Pineapple Express going on here. In fact, let's go up there and take a look at it. I don't know. Let's go up to 700 millibars. There it is. Maybe 850 might give us now. 700 is good. What we've got here is just look at the transport of moisture coming out of this thing wrap around the bottom side of that of that trough. And what's happened if we do go up another level is we got to be watching out for each of these systems here. Oops, let's get rid of that. We got to watch out for these deeper troughs to basically grab, well, there's another trough there. We have to watch out for these deeper ones to basically allow other shore waves to be racing around them and get tossed across the United States. Now, uh, my colleagues, uh, Matt Reardon, Andrew Pritchard, we were talking about this today, and I said, you know what this reminds me of? Do you remember in the Olympics when they were doing the, um, the, the, the bicycle racing around the big oval track inside is really highly banked? There's a, there's a part in it where the, the cyclists kind of grab onto each other's arms and fling each other forward. If you've never seen it, I went ahead and queued it up just so we can watch it. Uh, here's what I'm talking about. Just watch. Ready? Okay, watch these guys right here. Reaches back, grabs his arm, and then flings him, okay? And he gets a little extra speed uh, and so on. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Now, why am I doing this? This is why, okay? This is the trough ridge pattern from the 12Z ECMWF. Trough one, trough two. Those are the big dogs we're talking about. Yeah, we have a weak one that's already here over, the, over Michigan, but that one's going to just sit here and spin. I'm talking about these ones here. Now, what I want you to watch is this deeper lead trough, it's going to grab this shortwave right here and fling it around and just toss it across the middle part of the country. That's what they can do. So as we go through Thursday into Friday, let me go back and forth. 
You see him, he's like catching up. He's the guy in the back. Here's the lead cyclist. Uh, it's just going to grab hold of it and toss. There it is. There's the first toss. And here's the second one. See it? And therefore, we're, this pattern is at least allowing for pieces of that trough to move across the United States. And as one goes across here over the weekend, it's going to be a soaker for the central and eastern Corn Belt, produce some storms to the south. Then the bigger one right there, this one comes out, and it runs across next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And as it races across, it's going to bring in some cold air. It's actually connected to cold air. And uh, it's, it's also going to be producing quite a bit of inclement weather. And then as you get out there to next Friday, now this is a, a pattern shift, a temporary one, a temporary one, but we're building a ridge here. This trough is still sitting over much of the eastern half of the United States, but look, this ridge is still there and we've still got troughs of low pressure. So this isn't truly a pattern breakdown, but what it is, is it's a signal that we're gonna finally get some colder air to the eastern part of the United States. Now let me show you all these pieces coming together. We're gonna to go to the high res NAM. This is the 18Z run. Let's get it up queued up about eight o'clock tonight. So we were still watching that frontal boundary move here toward the Appalachian Mountains all the way down to the south, right? As we play this forward into the overnight and get it here to early morning on Friday, look at the, the front that's coming through the west. Meanwhile, still circulating around that deeper trough. Well, it's not that deep, but the trough that's over the northeast could get some scattered showers in through here. Also some stuff coming off the lakes. But as we go through Friday midday, Friday afternoon and evening. Again, scattered showers in this area. The big show's still over here in the west, though. I'll get back to that in a second. What we get by Friday evening, getting into Saturday morning, Saturday midday, and then Saturday afternoon and evening is the first of those weaker troughs come through. There it is. That's the next low forming. You can see the frontal boundary out ahead of it. There's higher pressure here feeding the moisture in. There's actually higher pressure to the north that's also feeding some moisture in. We're going to see a frontal boundary set up right there. Now that's the first of these systems that's getting flung around this deeper trough. But look, California, with the onslaught of moisture is just going to be continual for a while. And I'd like to show you that by giving you both models here. GFS is on the left, Europeans on the right. So we've watched through Friday midday, Friday evening, getting now into Saturday morning. Saturday midday and Saturday evening. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get out to where the deepest of the troughs comes into the west. And the first lead trough is out here in the high plains. So now you can pick up on it, okay? There's the frontal boundary we just talked about. It's in both models. As we play this forward into Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, we start to see there is low pressure forming here. It's in both models. The GFS is more progressive, but there's going to be a warm frontal boundary sitting in through here. Storms to the south. We'll curl this around the backside where there'll be some cooler air. I'll show you those temperatures in a moment. But that's on Sunday, getting now into Monday morning, Monday afternoon and evening. So that low in the GFS moves fast. It's a lot slower in the European. See, it's still sitting here by Monday evening. This, unfortunately, is going to be another round of rain for the eastern Corn Belt toward the Appalachian Mountains, including Tennessee, Kentucky, going to slow things down. Now, that's the first, I don't know, cyclist that gets flung out there. The second one then shows up on Tuesday evening, and the models are a little bit, um, there's a bit of disparity here. For example, the GFS puts a low here, but then has this elongated pressure trough. The European just has this elongated pressure trough, and it tries to develop a low farther to the south. Uh, similar features, but um, different overall. And then as we move this forward, I will tell you that as we get into, I just want to show you this on, 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 on uh, Tuesday night, I will be watching this whole corridor on Tuesday night for the chance for some strong to severe storms. Then now we go into next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. That then spreads. Look at the low developing here. It spreads into the east. So that's now the second round of heavier rain. And look, we have another system going into the northwest. As we go late into next week in California, you're, you're just not done yet. There's still more coming in. Okay, that's our multi-model analysis. Let's now put in together some of these numbers. So just remember, some of the places where you're seeing these systems come through, you got two of them that are coming right through here. We've been wet over the last 30 days. In fact, parts of Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan are sitting between 200 and 300% of normal precipitation. The Northern Plains have been extremely wet, but you'll see here that the next few systems are farther to the south, and therefore we're gonna miss that area. Drier pockets here, here, and all of this is gonna change in a big way because the models, this is what the total accumulated precipitation from the 12Z European looks like. Yeah, very wet through this part of the Corn Belt, wet through parts of the Mid-South, 
drier in Texas, high plains. But California, we still could be adding up here, as we talked about last week, uh, or earlier this week too, um, another 6 to 10 inches of precipitation on the Klamath Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, and along the coast here. Heavy rains right smack dab along the Coast I-5 corridor as well. Uh, this is what the GFS says. So again, European GFS. Remember, the differences here are in the resolution of the models as well. And if we compare them both, we end up getting this. So the European is much wetter through parts of the Mid-South and the Western Corn Belt. The GFS has a very narrow corridor of heavy rain from about Kankakee, Illinois, right here to central uh, um, uh, Pennsylvania. And you can almost see the European favors wetter conditions in Northern California. The GFS is wetter in the Sierra Nevada here. So just important to take note of the differences in these models. What about out there into week two? Oh, no, snow first, sorry. Some of the moisture coming in uh, next uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or this coming Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. We're talking 40 to 60 inches of snow in the peaks of the Sierra Nevada. And this goes up the Cascades as well. We're going to put some snow in the higher peaks in the interior, kind of the Great Basin and in the Rockies as well. Heavy snow, all elevation dependent here. And that's important because take a look at this. We're going to get maybe four feet of snow in the Sierra Nevada. Up to this point in this season, uh, we've got more snow, you know, in the plains of Montana than we have had in the Sierra Nevada. Some places there have already seen a foot of snow and uh, the Sierra Nevada need, need quite a bit more. All right, from there, what about that week two pattern? Well, Nick, take note of this. Our trough is still here. It's reloaded. But the flow is doing that. Now, you know this, right? It's when you come out of the trough. So here is where the best rising motion is and therefore most precipitation. On this side, you have upper level convergence. And that ridge is still there going to the end of October. Okay? So that's why the week two pattern goes back over drier here wetter in the northeast and still wetter in the northwest because that is where the troughs are ejecting here. I'll just draw the arrows to show you that, okay? Um, week two pattern. And then you saw what the rest of November is going to favor at the beginning of this video. Let's now take a look at uh, what the, uh, the GFS says because we kind of blow this up here. The GFS uh, basically is doing the same thing, okay? It's still got, as we go out there, fully into week two. I mean, you can see the flow convergence, better rising motion. And that's why, let's just go take a look at it here. If we pull up that week two precipitation pattern from the uh, GFS Ensemble, you see the same thing, wetter here and wetter there, but maybe a drier shot in this section of the country. All right, from there, let's talk temperatures. Finished out this near-term forecast, and I'm going to give you something for Europe, and we'll wrap it up. These were this morning's lows, so there was those cold temperatures here in the central and northern plains. But as we go forward, this is Friday's lows. You now start to see we're going to get uh, frost risk, as we saw at the beginning here um, of the video, right into this area. There's Friday's lows getting into Saturday, so another frost event throughout the upper Midwest. 40s coming through the eastern Corn Belt. And then if we get into Sunday, look at the heat that's coming back into the southern plains down here. Overnight lows in the 60s in, at the end of uh, October, just incredible. I will be on the lookout on Sunday morning for the potential for a frost. It's going to be elevation dependent here in the northeast as well. We can play this on forward to Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. How about those high temperatures? Let's go get a quick look at those. So here's tomorrow's highs on Friday, okay? Saturday into Sunday, warm, very warm, while the cooler air still wrapped around the low that's here over Quebec and Ontario. As we get into early next week, very cold here in the West compared to normal as the deeper trough finally makes its biggest punch on Sunday into Monday. And then going out there to Tuesday's highs and Wednesday's, that's what we got. Beyond that, let's go out there and look at the day 5 through 10 time period from the European, excuse me, from the GFS Ensemble. And this is the latest update for day 10 through 15. So you remember at that time, the flow pattern was doing this, right? So we could get some near normal to cooler than normal air in here. Why isn't it going to be brutally cold? Go back to the beginning. We are missing the cold reservoir of air to tap into, all right? So to finish this up, now that we've seen that 15-day forecast, I want to take you over to Europe real quick because I was just talking with a few colleagues today about the dryness we've seen across much of Europe uh, over the last 30 days. It's been actually quite dry in Ukraine and around the Black Sea. It's only been wet right here in this narrow corridor around the Black Sea. And so we think about the winter wheat getting planted in this area. 
And the forecast for much of November is to keep it quite dry. So there are some places in here that haven't received a, a drop of rainfall. And this could be an interesting story uh, when we think about the winter wheat crop. All right. Okay. Uh, that's all I'm going to share with you today. I'll, I'll keep analyzing it over the weekend and give you a new report on Monday. Have a good weekend. Thank you.